Okay, the next item of business is a debate on motion 9191 in the name of Michael Matheson on hospital home programme in Scotland. I'd invite members wishing to participate in the debate to press the request speak buttons now or as soon as possible. And I call on Michael Matheson to speak to and move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, around 11 minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy President Officer. I'm pleased to open today's debate on hostel, the hospital home programme. The health of every individual in our society is a priority for this government. And with every shift in approach to how we provide health care to the people of Scotland comes a need for scrutiny and public debate. Projections for future bed demand suggest that by 2031, Scotland will need to increase hostel bed capacity by around two to 3,000 beds. This is the equivalent of five large district general hospitals. So it's essential that we look at alternative, sustainable solutions for patients and for our healthcare system. Since 2020, the Scottish Government has invested some £7.6 million in the development of hospital at home. And I was delighted to announce a few weeks ago a further £3.6 million for this financial year to support its further expansion across Scotland. This will increase our current capacity by some 50 per cent by the end of 2023-24, allowing more people to receive the care they would usually receive in hospital at home. Hospital at home services are consultant-led, with expert teams on hand to provide short-term hospital-level care. Patients have access to interventions such as oxygen and intravenous antibiotics and investigations such as ECG and scans at home or in a care home. Hospital at Home has been in operation now in Scotland for over a decade. We now have services in nearly every board and partnerships across Scotland. I'd like to put on record uh, my thanks for the excellent work done by the dedicated healthcare professionals delivering care across the country around the clock to make this possible. We are all aware of the fundamental issues facing our health service. Increasing demand, increasing complexity and increasing acuity mean that when there is a surge in demand, our NHS and our wider health and social care system is at times under significant pressure. We are still dealing with the combined shock of the global pandemic and, of course, Brexit, which are making securing workforce very challenging. Over recent months, services have been working hard to recover, but pressure on acute hospital services has been increasing throughout the UK now for some time. The culmination of this is increased hospital occupancy levels, which are routinely at around 95%, well above historic levels and beyond what is acceptable. We must, in the best interests of both patients and the people who work in the NHS and in the social care sector, use every lever available to us to address these combined pressures. Key to reducing demand on our hostels is to provide care closer to home. Hostel at home is one of the levers we are already using very successfully. In 2022-23, over 63,000 bed days were provided by hostel at home services for older people. In fact, data released by Healthcare Improvement Scotland this month showed that the number of older people admitted to hospital at home services in 2022-23 is almost the equivalent of a large city hostel like Aberdeen Royal Infirmary, making Hospital at Home the fifth biggest hospital for older people. But beyond considering the challenges on the system within health and social care, we must first and foremost consider what the people of Scotland want and need. 10% of people over 65 in Scotland are living with frailty. And we know this can have a considerable impact on a person's quality of life. We also know that older people in Scotland, in particular, 
are often those most significantly impacted by hospital stays. Evidence tells us that on average, 10 days in a hospital bed is equivalent of 10 years of muscle wasting for an older person. Admission of a patient with frailty to an acute ward increases the likelihood of them losing muscle strength, agility and, of course, confidence. By taking people who may already be frail out of a hostile setting, we can reduce deconditioning and exposure to other avoidable harms, such as hostile acquired infections, including delirium and falls. More than happy to give way. Alec Rowley. I'm grateful for the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. And uh, as somebody in Fife who's watched Hospital Home develop over many years, I'm a big supporter. But does he accept that these elderly, frail people need, we have to, as a government, ensure that these people have the support they need in the community and therefore social care needs to be able to respond? Cabinet Secretary. I, I do agree with that point um, uh, uh, that has been made. And of course, uh, Fife has been one of the leaders around the development of Hospital Home. But of course, we need to make sure that social care provision is able to meet the demands that come alongside that as well, which is why we're taking forward considerable not just investment in social care, but also around the development of a national care service. Officer, we also know that a hostel stay is, by its very nature, removes people from their home environment, away from their surroundings and their loved ones, which can lead to distress and anxiety. There are uh, practical considerations for a patient's carers and families, such as transport, which can make a hospital stay a disruptive and sometimes expensive time for the family. So we must ask the question, is hospital always the best place for every patient to receive the treatment that they need? Sometimes, of course, the answer will be yes, but that is not always the case. Recent evidence review identified several key findings on the benefits of hospital at home. Firstly, Hospital at home can be delivered safely without increased rates of death or readmission to acute care. Hospital at home may reduce the likelihood of patients living in residential care following an acute episode. And patients expressed high levels of satisfaction with the services. And finally, the cost of hospital at home are generally lower than for inpatient care. And crucially, patients value being in the comfort and the familiarity of their own home and appreciate the reduced disruption to their daily routines. I think Finley the member was trying to make an intervention. Finley Finley uh, I appreciate the Cabinet Secretary giving away. Whilst uh, many of us appreciate the, the importance of care at home, uh, in areas like Dumfries and Galloway, the severe lack of uh, nurses uh, and, and, and help to, to deliver that care at home, there's still a role for cottage hospitals. And cottage hospitals and the value for the community were, was recognised by the First Minister and, and his role as the, the, the Health Minister. Would you not agree that step-down facilities like cottage hospitals still play a big role and, and can also voice my disappointment you're not coming to collect a petition signed by 4,000 people to see Newton Stewart and Kikubri cottage hospitals reopened? Cabinet Secretary, I can give you that time back. Uh, uh, officer, uh, the issue about the design of healthcare services locally is best directed by the local health board and health and social care partnerships and the integrated joint boards. Knowing what's the best way in which to meet the needs of uh, the local community, in my view, is the most appropriate approach. And hospital at home can play an important part in that. And I know in Dumfries and Galloway, they are taking forward work in order to develop and expand their service. Officer, but we also need to be honest about the challenges we face in expanding hospital at home. Whilst NHS Scotland's staffing levels are at a historic high due to 10 years of consecutive growth, clearly recruitment and redeployment of staff is a limiting factor, particularly in more remote and rural areas. It's unquestionable that the loss of EU uh, freedom of movement has put unnecessary barriers in place to recruit staff from Europe and, of course, the UK's post-Brexit immigration system is certainly not helping. The Scottish Government recognised the challenges that boards and frontline staff are facing, which is why we announced £8 million of funding to support boards to recruit an extra 750 nurses, midwives and AHPs from overseas by the 31st of March 2023 
and they have made good progress in taking that forward. Officer, NHS Scotland has been expanding capacity across a series of clinical pathways to manage the ongoing pressures of acute care to help support recovery towards a sustainable future. These new models of care have been developed, of course, at pace. We must also double, double the amount of virtual beds. We have almost doubled the amount of virtual beds from 441 at the beginning of 2022 to 806 beds by the end of March this year. This is equivalent to adding an extra district general hospital in just 15 months. That's 806 patients every day receiving care at home who might otherwise have been in hospital. And since 2020, I've got very little time left, I'm afraid. And since 2020, we have invested significantly in the development of hospital at home, recognising its value as we seek to re recover from the pandemic. Our ambition is to continue the expansion of hospital at home across a range of specialities and to expand our capacity in preparation for winter to help create responsive and resilient services for the future. Presiding officer, the recovery of the NHS is dependent upon implementing innovative models of care that put the individual's best interests at their heart. Hospital at Home is a prime example of just that, a delivery model that benefits not only patients, their families and their carers, but also go a significant way to reducing pressure on acute hospitals and NHS staff in an effective and compassionate way. The challenges of the pandemic have compelled our public services to innovate and adapt. And we must now build on this momentum to transform the way we deliver care. The continued expansion of hospital at home supports our ambition to ensure that people receive the right care for them in the right place at the right time. And I move the motion in my name. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I now call on Sandy Gulhani to speak to and move Amendment 9191.2 for around seven minutes. Dr Gulhani. Thank you. I wish to declare an interest as a practising NHS GP and move the amendment in my name. The Hospital at Home's programme's aims are laudable. It is indeed right, where safe to do so, to provide elderly patients and those who need medical treatment and care in the comfort and familiarity of their own home. Treatment might include having an IV or oxygen supply. There's also scope to provide access to hospital tests. And as a doctor, I can see the good hospital at home can be, and I've seen it in my own patients. Of course, the more we can deliver safe care at home, then the more we can free up capacity in our hospitals. And we are crying out for solutions. And that's because, and this is an undisputed fact, that successive SNP health secretaries have failed to tackle delayed discharge from our hospitals. In February 2015, today's Deputy First Minister declared when she was health secretary that she would end delayed discharges in Scotland by the end of that year. Yet another tiresome SNP announcement. However, the reality is that over the past eight years, more than 3,000 patients who were medically fit to go home have died on the wards. In March 23, there were over 54,000 days spent in hospital by those whose, delayed, whose discharge was delayed. So hospital at home can make a difference, though we must be realistic when it comes to resourcing the programme and deploying teams of mobile specialists. Tapping into a seemingly endless number of beds available in patients' own homes does not solve the problem of shortages of clinicians within the NHS. Since the programme first launched in 2011, it has rolled out to every health board except NHS Dumfries and Galloway and NHS Shetland. During the main COVID years between 2020 and 2022, the programme received £8.1 million pounds in funding. Uh, I will, yes. Emma Harper. It's interesting what uh, Dr Gulhani is saying about NHS Dumfries and Galloway, and I thank him for taking that intervention because I know time is short. My understanding is that NHS Dumfries and Galloway have taken forward a home teams approach, which is how they are delivering the equivalent of hospital at home. Sandy Gulhani, I can give you the time back. As I said at the start of my statement, I would welcome anything that reduces delayed discharge. 
Uh, by May 2022, the Scottish Government said there were an estimated 275 virtual beds created through Hospital at Home. And for comparison, there are 333 staff beds at University Hospital Air. It was then announced 275 bed number would double by the end of that year. That didn't happen. So we have another announcement. 3.6 million to the Hospital at Home programme for the financial year to create 156 additional virtual beds. The Scottish Conservatives support any measures to alleviate the pressures on our NHS, such as the SNP's delayed discharge crisis. You may recall that we published a raft of proposals in our winter recovery plan, and these included expanding the REACH team, the initiative which helps patients to rehabilitate following a hospital stay and make adaptations to their home. The Royal College of Physicians in Edinburgh has said that while it welcomes increased investment in efforts to get patients out of hospital earlier and reduce admissions, such initiatives require extra staffing. Hospital at home services must be developed and resourced in addition to existing services, not at the expense of those existing services. And this isn't my view, it is the view of the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. This requires adequate numbers of well-trained staff across MDT teams, including medical nursing, rehabilitation therapy and care staff. Professor Andrew Elder of the Royal College of Physicians Edinburgh is reported as saying, we do not have sufficient numbers of such staff at present either in hospital or in the community, and we will need to see more recruited as our population continues to age and their care rise. And if the hospital at home programme is going to be expanded, the health secretary should fully assess the impact on informal carers. Hospital at home services should not pile unsustainable pressures on unpaid carers. It is important to get this right. The last thing we need is another announcement with no credible plan and failed delivery. We know that elderly people who receive care at home have less risk of delirium at the one month follow up. We also heard from the health secretary about how it improves muscle mass. Staying in your own home for longer without losing independence results in better well-being and satisfaction. In health, however, we cannot consider solutions in isolation. Silo thinking won't work. To make care at home work, we must improve performance along the whole elderly care pathway. More cash for hospital at home should go hand in hand with marked improvements in A&E waiting times. Must remember, our over 75s attend A&E at higher rates than any other age group. In fact, double that of the 65 to 74 year olds. In the week ending May 2023, only 64.1% of patients were seen within four hours. 11% waited eight and 4.4 over 12. Uh, I will briefly. Bob Doris. I thank Sanders Kahali for, for, for giving way. You make a very important point there. Would you agree that the uh, hospital at home initiative is also partly about anticipatory care and referrals can come from GPs before a hospital admission or at A&E instead of a hospital admission? So that chimes very much, I think, with the point you're making there, Mr Gohani. Uh, through the chair, please, for interventions as well as uh, other comments. Dr Gohani, I'll give you the time back. Yes, I have made a referral myself to hospital at home. But more people are waiting longer in A&E at the end of the First Minister's tenure as Health Secretary than when he started the job. The a &E waiting times must improve so our elderly are seen sooner and with better outcomes when they return home. The SNP Green Government still seems to be pursuing the establishment of a national care service to centralise rather than empower local decision making, despite criticism from national care service plans from SNP members, Unison, Cosler, the Scottish Ambulance Service. Here's a flavour. The NCS bill does not represent any value for money whatsoever. It's a blank cheque from the public purse. It seems like a sledgehammer to crack a nut. If this proposal goes through, staff are going to feel concerned about their jobs and their wages and pensions, and as a result, look for jobs elsewhere. It risks the overall NHS Scotland ambition to shift the balance of care. For hospital at home to work, we need a strong primary care. But with closures like the GP practice in Invergarry just today, the SNP government is failing the people of Scotland. After 16 years in government, the SNP Greens seem out of ideas when it comes to fixing our NHS, while the principle 
of hospital at home is good, the government is tinkering. It is devoured of strategy and we can't see joined up thinking. No vision. Scotland needs a fresh approach which incorporates a modern, efficient and local solution into healthcare where the Scottish Conservatives would increase primary care funding envelope to 11%. Thank you, Dr. Gulhani. I now call uh, Paul Sweeney to speak to and move Amendment 9191.1 um, up to six minutes, or around six minutes, Mr. Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I move the amendment in my name. Hospital Home is an initiative that we in Labour support. We have heard already the benefits of delivering health care external to a hospital or acute care setting, all which are entirely valid and commendable. For a long time, we have been advocating for an approach to health care that is based on prevention rather than reaction. And for a long time, we have been arguing that reducing the pressure on acute hospitals and acute care settings is essential and will deliver better outcomes. Everyone in this chamber is well aware of the benefits of early intervention. And equally, we are all aware of the consequences for hospitals and acute care settings when services that facilitate uh, early intervention and prevention fail. So we do support the principle of the hospital at home programme. And we will work with the government to ensure that patients who are in a position to benefit from the programme are able to do so. Throughout my time in this role so far, I have always done my best to be constructive, and I think that is an approach I would like to continue today. A cross-party approach to tackling the crisis in our National Health Service will be crucial, and in the interest of cooperation, we will support the government motion today along with the Conservative amendment. And in the interest of trying to make a success of the Hospital at Home programme, it is important that the government acknowledge that turning it into a sticking plaster just won't suffice. Because if we are going to make a success of this programme, it needs to be done with the recognition that in many ways our NHS is in dire straits and that we must address the root causes of the problems that we face today. And those problems are found across our National Health Service. One in seven people in Scotland on an NHS waiting list, a social care policy programme that is in tatters, over 160,000 bed days lost to delayed discharge in 2023 alone, and over 1 million bed days lost to de delayed discharge since the current First Minister was first appointed as Health Secretary, one in 10 GP practices in Scotland no longer accepting new patients a vacancy rate of over 11% for registered nurses in district nursing and a vacancy rate of 12.5% for registered nurses in community settings. I take absolutely no pleasure in rhyming off that list of problems and I want nothing more than for each and every one of them to be resolved immediately for the benefit of patients who desperately rely on them because we all have skin in the game, Deputy Presiding Officer. But the reality is that those problems do exist today and the harsh truth is that for as long as they do, hospital at home will fail to live up to its full potential. Of all the problems that do exist, the most egregious is the workforce crisis engulfing the NHS and social care. As I outlined briefly earlier, vacancies are at a record high. And given the multifaceted and multidisciplinary nature of the Hospital at Home programme, there is the distinct possibility that it fails purely due to a workforce shortage. That is why our amendment sets out the need for a long-term funding settlement for the Hospital at Home programme, and that is something we would happily work with the government eh, on should they desire it. And while the workforce crisis in our NHS may take some time to resolve, given the training lead times and issues around that, there is no excuse for the workforce crisis in social care. The backlog in delayed discharge is in no small part down to a lack of a social care plan, and one of my primary concerns about the Hospital at Home programme is they'll be used to try and mask the crisis in delayed discharge. And we also see that play out in adjacent services such as hospice care. Indeed, I visited the Prince and Princess of Wales Hospice in Glasgow just a few weeks ago, and they highlighted that a third of their beds are unusable due to the lack of specialist nursing staff. So Labour has set out our plan to increase the pay of social care workers to £15 an hour at a cost of approximately £150 million a year. But we've also identified three areas with an opportunity cost value of almost 300 million from which that money could be found, which would ensure that we also have a further economic multiplier effect in our wider economy through the marginal propensity to consume. So I call on the government to back us on that commitment and increase the social care pay to £15 an hour. It would go a long way to alleviating the pressure 
on hard-pressed social care staff. It would go a long way to resolving the workforce crisis in social care. And fundamentally, it would ease pressure on frontline services by reducing the level of delayed discharge that is clogging up the system. In closing, Deputy Presiding Officer, the Labour Party supports the Hospital at Home programme. We commend it, but we are clear that there needs to be a realistic and pragmatic assessment about the extent to which it will be beneficial given these crises. Without a long-term funding settlement, without a long-term plan to fix that workforce crisis in our NHS, and without a long-term prospectus for the future of our social care sector, it risks becoming a mere sticking plaster and another initiative that is doomed to failure before it has gotten off the ground. And that would be a real shame, Deputy Presiding Officer, because the need for a programme like this to succeed is greater than ever before. And if done right, it has the potential to enable significant progress for public health in Scotland. Thank you very much, Mr Sweeney. I now call Alex Cole-Hamilton around four minutes. Mr Cole-Hamilton. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I'm very pleased to speak uh, for the Liberal Democrats in this debate. And I thank Michael Matheson for securing time for it in the Chamber. Liberal Democrats are committed to improving the quality of care for patients across Scotland and we believe that the hospital at home programme is a valuable way of so doing. Um, as we've heard, hospital at home is a model of care that provides treatment and support for patients in their own homes rather than in a hospital setting. It can relieve that interruption of flow that we've, we all well to know too well that is causing delays in A&E and cancelled operations for people who are stuck in our main hospitals. It's patient-centred alternative to acute hospital admission, reducing the number of those patients stuck in hospital wards, removing many of the challenges associated with admission. And we know it leads to better outcomes for many people because being at home is a better place to be. Indeed, there are clear and obvious health benefits in allowing patients to maintain their independence, spend more time with their family and their loved ones, whilst programmes like this one also reduce the risk of infection. We could also save the NHS uh, millions of pounds every year. Um, that's why Hospital at Home was in my party's manifesto at the last Scottish election, and why we've consistently called for more money to be invested into the programme to roll it out more extensively. And I am gratified the Scottish Government has followed our lead with the £3.6 million investment that they announced this month. That's a welcome step, but they need to go much, much further. That's because there are a number of issues with the service. There have uh, been reports of a lack of coordination at some points between the hospital at home team and other healthcare providers, such as doctors and nurses working at the hospital. That's not to denigrate their work in any way at all. It is just to recognise the immense pressures that they're under. But the resulting confusion makes it difficult to ensure that the patient uh, receives the best care possible. This service also remains unavailable in a number of areas across the country, adding it to the list of valuable services for which a postcode lottery takes place. And my party want to see its expansion of the service to cover more areas of Scotland and an increase in the number of staff uh, that are attendant to it. We also want to see more training for staff currently working in the service and an investment in new technology. For example, the use of more remote patient monitoring, which can help to identify problems early and prevent patients, can also assuage the need for those patients to be admitted to hospital in the first place. It's also vital that hospital and home, uh, at home services are developed. I will, to Emma, um, Emma Harper. Thank you very much for giving way. Um, would Alec Hall Hamilton welcome the remote monitoring that's been implemented by NHS to Fries and Galloway for the monitoring of their COPD and respiratory patients? Because that's working really well to keep folk out of hospital. Alex Cole Hamilton, I can give you the time back. Yes, and I congratulate that health board for rolling that out successfully. Any remote monitoring um, for any long, particularly long term or uh, chronic condition or chronic condition with um, uh, attendant comorbidities is to be welcomed. So, yes, I, I, I welcome Emma Harper's intervention. And it is also vital that hospital at home services are developed and resourced in addition to existing services, not instead of them. Those aren't just my words, they are the words of Andrew Elder, the president of the Royal College of Physicians in Edinburgh. Um, he also raised concerns at about, about current staff shortages, both in our hospitals and in our communities. Our NHS is indeed being stretched beyond its capacity. We hear that day in, day out in debates like this in this chamber, presiding officer. And it's no different when it comes to hospital at home. Whilst the government's total failure to lack delayed, uh, tackle del uh, delayed discharge is continuing to have a significant impact. 
Signing officer, if this scheme is going to work, it needs to be valued by this government. That's why I'm calling on them to make sure that this £3.46 million pound investment, as welcome as it is, is just the floor. It's the beginning. Um, and that we build on it significantly, very swiftly from hereafter. And if they're struggling for ideas on how to pay for that, can I suggest that they scrap that multi-billion pound takeover of social care? Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Cole Hamilton. We move to the open debate, and I call first Claire Hockey to be followed by Oliver Mundell. Uh, around four minutes, Ms. Hockey. Thank you, President Officer, and I refer members to my register of interests. We all want to be in a position that as much health care as possible can be provided to people closer to their homes. And over the past few years, there has been sustained and coordinated efforts in providing community alternatives to hospital, all while maintaining and improving patient experience. As evidence during the COVID pandemic, making it easier than ever to know where to go to get the right care in the right place was vitally important, saving patients time and freeing up space in our GP practices and hospitals. Whether it was through NHS Pharmacy First Scotland or the Hospital at Home Service, these initiatives played a key role in relieving pressure on our health and social care services. Presiding officer, during times of ill health, most of us would want to be with are close to our loved ones and in familiar surroundings. And the hospital at home service allows people to receive treatment that would otherwise have required them to be admitted to hospital, such as an intravenous drip for administering antibiotics or for oxygen therapy. And it also provides access to hospital tests while under the care of a consultant in an, in an individual's own home. Hospital at Home as an alternative allows patients to receive high quality person centred care and treatment in the right place and at the same time reducing acute admissions and supporting timely discharge. Additionally, the provision of the service has the benefit that it can help avoid some of the risks of healthcare acquired infection. And the effects on older people of remaining in hospital too long are well documented. Deconditioning, pressure sores, a loss of independence, which can make it harder for the individual to return home. And we know that frail patients tend to occupy hospital beds for a longer period of time, and that alternatives to this can produce a far better health outcome. That's why admission to hospital should only happen when the patient's clinical need requires it. If that level of care and treatment can be provided at home, then we should endeavour to provide it there. Presiding Officer, Hospital at Home has been in existence in a number of countries across the world for around 25 years. And the first service was introduced in Scotland by NHS Lanarkshire, the health board which serves my Rutherglen constituency, and that occurred in 2011. This multidisciplinary acute care services delivers specialist coordinated and comprehensive assessment and care to frailer older adults in their own homes. Although Hospital at Home is not a new approach, Efforts to expand it are currently being ramped up and only this month the Health Secretary announced a further £3.6 million to the service. The investment for 2023-24, which will take the total funding in the programme to more than £10.7 million since 2020, will increase patients managed through hospital at home by 50%, equivalent of an additional 156 beds. And from the success of the scheme so far, we can see that there is a real benefit to treating people at home where possible. Looking at the feedback from patients and relatives, it's clear how value, valued the hospital at home programme has been and how beneficial it is for patients' care. From the hospital visits the service has saved to how supported individuals felt in the recovery, it's clear the service is overwhelmingly viewed as positive. However, presiding officer, as was highlighted by Healthcare Improvement Scotland in 2020, the hospital at home service isn't a silver bullet in reducing pressures on acute hospital care provision. As a result of the pandemic backlogs, Brexit-driven staff shortages and UK inflation costs, the Scottish Government is required to look across the wider health and social care system and implement innovative approaches to meet these ongoing challenges. Hospital at home, taken together with work in tackling delayed discharge, improving a &E weights and increasing NHS and social care staffing levels will improve patient experience and ensure better outcomes. Thank you, Ms Hockey. I now call Oliver Mundell to be followed by Christine Graham. Around four minutes, please, Mr Mundell.
Thank you, Presiding Officer. Through my own, albeit limited, life experience and my work as a constituency MSP, I'm well aware that for many people, hospital is not the best place to be. Of course, no one really wants to be in hospital at all if they can avoid it. But for some people, the disruption and change involved in being admitted to an acute setting can teeter on the brink of outweighing the benefits of medical treatment. For those individuals, this initiative is and has the potential to be transformative. But if this initiative is going to work, it must be promoted on that basis. It should be for the patient's benefit, not merely to serve the system. Indeed, as Professor Andrew Elder has stressed, as mentioned by Alex Cole Hamilton, access to acute hospital care for older people has been a hard-won right, and it should not uh, just be given away uh, because there's an alternative there. That alternative must meet every patient who's pushed towards its needs. Presiding officer, looking now beyond the individual, I have to say that I'm always fearful when I hear what are still relatively new initiatives uh, and talks of expansion uh, being pr promoted by this SNP government. These concerns stem from the staffing and cash crisis in our NHS and from my experience of a persistent lack of rural proofing when it comes to policy implementation. In my own health board area of Dumfries and Galloway, we have the chief executive of the NHS telling this parliament that the level of financial challenge is such that he technically can't afford one in 10 of his workforce. So when I hear my colleague uh, Finlay Carson uh, raising the question around the future of cottage hospitals, it's hard to know and to trust the decision the health board are making uh, because they are operating in financial circumstances where they are making the best of the resource they've got rather than doing what's best for their patients. We see already uh, patients unable to access core day-to-day -day services such as GPs and dentistry. We see challenges around recruiting and retaining specialist medical professionals. Who are these consultants uh, that are going to be uh, helping with patient care? Social care and care home beds are being rationed with care deserts emerging in some parts of the region. I set this out not because I don't support the concept of hospital at home, but because many constituents, patients and hard-working staff will be questioning the capacity to pull this off at any significant scale in the current climate. I am also concerned that when it comes to stabilising our local health service, this SNP government is not willing to confront the realities on the ground. All the strategies and policies that have been laid out to date speak to this as they simply do not match with the scale of the challenge that lies ahead. In place of a laser light focus, for example, in this area on getting people already in hospital home, we come up with uh, new ideas uh, and initiatives uh, rather than uh, trying to uh, resolve the very serious underlying issues that already exist. Moving on, I'm, already, I'm also equally worried about how this policy can be delivered in a constituency such as mine, where people live a considerable distance from the hospital overseeing their treatment. They may even be treated outside the region altogether, never mind pushing an hour from DGRI and Dumfries. Care at home uh, means uh, that they should have access uh, to good quality local health care uh, in the region. Uh, and we must take account of the additional costs rurality brings the additional pressures, the additional time constraints uh, in order to deliver projects such as this across vastly sparse rural population areas. And I'm not convinced to date from the Scottish Government's record that they've got this right. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Mundell. I now call Christine Graham to be followed by Carol Mochin. Around four minutes, please, Ms Graham. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I have to admit that until recently, with a news programme on hospital at home, I was unaware that this existed. That's my failure. I note in the Scottish Government motion it states that this is a cost-effective alternative to acute care, but most importantly, provides very good clinical outcomes, which is what we all want. It also frees up hospital beds and, of course, the staff to service those beds. Hospital at home is a short-term targeted intervention, providing acute-level hospital care in an individual's own home or homely setting. 
The impact so far, there's a 53% increase in patients managed by hospital at home services, and it has prevented over 11,000 people spending time in hospital during 2022-23, relieving pressure from A&E and, importantly, the Scottish Ambulance Service. Again, importantly, we're in the comfort of their own home, surrounded by the familiar, all aiding, in my view, to better physical and, indeed, mental health. To quote one patient, I was delighted. It was unbelievable. It was totally different from being in hospital. One thing I haven't mentioned is the fact that it's the personal between the two of us. I wasn't just a number. It makes a difference. In Midlothian Hospital at Home Team, it's called MERIT, which is the acronym for Midlothian Enhanced Rapid Response and Intervention Team. It's an acute team based in Midlothian Community Hospital offering an assessment of medical needs in the patient's own home or care home using a holistic multidisciplinary approach during the acute phase of an illness. It offers an opportunity to identify a potentially unwell patient, better persuade a patient to accept hospital admission as a safer place of care or direct a more appropriate service. But it should also be recognised there may be some specific circumstances where remote triage may also be appropriate, such as seen within the last 24 hours by a GP or by another clinician. There's a very clear indication of known recurrent or stable condition or examination findings are unlikely to change the place of care. In other words, as others have said, the right treatment in the right place, which may be a hospital or home. But there's criteria to being referred to hospital at home. And here are some sort of short examples. Obviously, if it's Midlothian, you're going to be a resident there. And secondly, your personal care requirements can be met in the community. You're safe at home, self-caring, or there's existing packages of care or the support of a family. There's also strict guidance on who not to refer. For instance, if you get chest pain, acute stroke, asthma, suspected DVT, suspected fracture, other suspected acute surgical emergency, or indeed the patient or family is unwilling to stay at home. So it's a discussion with the person in their home about what is most suitable to them. NHS Borders Hospital Home Service just started admitting patients in April of this year. It's therefore the newest such service in Scotland, and rurality is an issue but it can be covered because the BGH is far away from many people, the Borders General Hospital. I welcome progress in hospital home, which seems to me to be a plus all round, in particular and centrally to patients, if it's practical, being assessed and treated in familiar surroundings, which must be good for them. Thank you. Thank you, Ms Graham. I now call Cara Mochin to be followed by Emma Harper. And in terms of our agreement reached with the Labour Group, uh, Ms Mochin has six minutes. Ms. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm happy to speak in this evening's debate and take the opportunity at the beginning of my contribution to reiterate my party's support for hospital to home, uh, the hospital at home service, services we know to be vital for delivering the health care of the future by bringing hospital standard care into the home using a uh, technology. Although we agree with the benefits of the hospital at home service, recognise its usefulness thus far and want to see its success continue, it is disingenuous to suggest that investment here is anywhere near enough. We need widespread resource for our NHS, which is struggling on many fronts. And we do need the government to explain its long-term investment plan for the hospital at home service. It is right that my Labour colleague Paul Sweeney set out the reality in our health service and the backdrop of the debate today. One in seven Scots are on waiting lists, delayed discharges alarmingly high, NHS staff, despite their greatest efforts, are being let down by a government that no matter how often it tries to argue to the contrary, has undervalued and under-resourced a critical workforce and our patients are being failed uh, by the lack of support to staff. Initiatives and programmes such as Hospital at Home are welcomed, but the wider picture cannot be ignored. Indeed, it is also correct that we ask the Scottish Government to set out its plans for delivering hospital at home services for the longer term. term it seems a little bit that we do not get this long term alternative to acute hospital care to understand it. Um, and we kind of see 
as a, as a quick fix or a tokenistic gesture, which just allows pressure to be put back on acute services when anything falls short. At this juncture, presiding officer, I wish to recognise the multidisciplinary nature of this service and the importance of various workforces within our NHS and social care services in delivering it. It is right that we commend Health Improvement Scotland and National Education Scotland for their work in this regard so far, and I pay tribute to our allied health professionals, the third largest workforce in our NHS, who go above and beyond to deliver specialist care services for our most vulnerable people in the most challenging of times. We are all aware that without doctors, nurses, carers and unpaid carers and the allied health professionals working together to meet the individual needs of every patient, hospital at home does not work and it is right that we do all we can to support them. Therefore, presiding officer, it would be appropriate for the Scottish Government to listen to the concerns of, for example, the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh, as we have heard in their comments ahead of today's debate, highlighting concerns linked to the potential over-reliance on unpaid carers who are already under serious and significant pressure to look after those in their care to provide support during periods of, un of increased patient need. Indeed, they argue that the provision of hospital at home must be an addition to existing services, not a replacement for them to ensure that the hard-won rights of older people to have care in acute hospital settings should uh, it be most appropriate to, for their needs not be lost. So I think it would be useful for the government in their concluding remarks just to talk about the long-term future for hospital at home and address some of these important points when doing so. I, I, know, I know, um, you know that, that the speaker before me did mention that they were unaware of the, the, the service. Um, and so I think if, if MSPs in the chamber are unaware of the service, it does give you that sense of how people out in their communities understand the service. And so although I, I know the, the, the minister and the cabinet secretary are looking over, I know that you feel it's very embedded, but for many people it doesn't, doesn't feel that way and it would be useful if you address that. Um, we need to, as we have heard, talk about the staff challenges that we have, about how uh, one in G G uh, ten GPs um, have formally clo closed to new patient lists. The RCN confirmed that community nursing teams are under extreme pressure for vac vacancy rates, and we also know that the HPs are under, vac uh, under stress for, for vacancy rates as well. This is all underpinned by a failure thus far to fully implement the safe staffing legislation that this Parliament passed years ago, legislation to protect our overworked workforce. Um, and we know that services like this um, will need strong protection for the NHS staff. And so we should look back at that legislation and make sure it is implemented appropriately within our wards and within any services such as this. Um, I want to turn to social care, and it has been touched on. It is undermined, you know, the whole of community uh, services is undermined by a crisis in social care, and the government can avoid that. Carers are not being paid the fair wage they deserve, and serious concerns across Scotland about the provision of well-funded and locally available social care is there. It is clear, as set out in our amendment, Scottish Labour's amendment, that we will only be able to deliver the standard of social care required and a strong hospital at home programme by immediately uplifting social care pay. And I also want to mention at this point um, the recommendation in the Feely Review about the removing of non-residential care charges. These are important issues that have not been addressed by the government. In concluding, presiding officer, I reiterate my party's support for the intentions and aims of Hostel at Home and recognise this as an important step forward, encouraging the use of alternative care. A, a close friend of mine a commu with community nursing experience of many years tells me patients seem less anxious and this must be a really good thing for care. However, it is clear that we have issues and support for resources in the NHS and social care workforce. And I hope the Cabinet Secretary and Minister will address this in closing tonight. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. Thank you, Ms Mohan. And I now call Emma Harper to be followed by Gillian Mackay. Around four minutes, please, Ms Harper. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to speak in the Government's motion today. And I remind Chamber that I'm a registered nurse and former employee of NHS in Freeson Galloway. 
As members and the Cabinet Secretary have indicated, the purpose of hospital at home is to reduce hospital admissions by providing treatments in the comfort and fam familiarity of a person's own home. And Claire Hawkey has described the types of treatment received, like intravenous infusions or oxygen therapy. And evidence shows that those benefiting from the service are more likely to avoid hospital or care home stays after a period of acute illness. And for older patients, it means remaining at home longer without losing independence, as this has contributed to overall improvements in patient satisfaction and improving well-being. Presiding officer, I'm a member of the Health, Social Care and Sport Committee, which is currently undertaking scrutiny of the NHS boards, including the rural boards in my South Scotland region. NHS Borders Chief Executive Rafe Roberts he told us that uh, reablement work is being implemented in his board. And reablement refers to the care a person receives after experiencing an illness or injury. And the main aim of reablement is to allow people to gain or regain their confidence, their ability and the necessary skills to live as independently as possible, especially after an illness, injury or deterioration in health. And reablement is a person-centred approach and support is usually delivered in the person's home or even in a care home. This work has led to an increase in people receiving hospital at home care and this of course is welcome. Presiding officer delayed discharge is one of the largest issues facing boards in Scotland and I welcome as the motion indicates that the Scottish Government is providing ongoing support to boards in a range of areas including discharge planning. And just give me a wee sec. Home Teams is a new health and social care model of working which is being delivered in Dumfries and Galloway to help people live healthier lives in their home and also to tackle delayed discharge. Yes, I will give it to Mr Carson. Thank the member for giving away. Will the member recognise that there are huge gaps in the provision that home uh, care uh, currently providing Dumfries and Galloway, much to do with the rurality and the lack of, of staff. Will you agree with me that step-down facilities such as our cottage hospitals or uh, uh, similar facilities are needed in our rural towns to ensure that people can be looked after close to home and not uh, form the record-breaking figures for delayed discharge in DGRI? Uh, Ms. Harper, I'll give you your time back. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Finlay Carson, for the intervention. I think the issue of rurality is hugely important for us in Dumfries and Galloway and the Scottish borders. And I acknowledge that uh, NHS, uh, the Health and Social Care Partnership, are doing a consultation right now about community bed provision. And I look forward to the results. But I absolutely agree that uh, we need to be looking at whatever care can be provided as close to home as possible. Possible. So I support whatever mechanism we can do to take that forward. Um, similarly to the hospital at home, home teams, as, it's, as I was describing, um, they pulls together the multidisciplinary team and resources within the community under one team. And they're doing this to ensure that there's less referrals to acute care. And they're ensuring that people tell their story once without repeating it. And they're also ensuring that reduced wait and response times is, is also delivered and the provision of a holistic approach is taken to look at the whole person. So again, it's a person-centred approach that Home Teams has taken forward. And Home Teams have led NHS and Fraser and Galloway to redeploy 52 community staff to support 102 packages of care, which equates to 120 individuals receiving the hospital at home model. And there's 18 beds that are being created uh, in Mountain Hall Treatment Centre as an intermediate care facility as a step down from acute care. And that's similar to what Mr Carson was talking about earlier. And I don't think I have time for um, another intervention no, I'm the because be it would take a six up. minute speech to go into the detail about the provision that's required across the whole rural area. So uh, apologies, uh, Mr Mundell, that I can't do that. Um, what I'm interested in focusing on is the, you know, looking forward to the community bed provision consultation responses because we all know that people do want their care closer to home and I thank NHS and Friesen Galloway for the innovative work that they are taking forward to make a difference to patient outcomes. The presiding officer, as well as hospital at home, the outpatient parenteral antimicrobial treatment scheme and respiratory community response teams now offer more than 600 virtual beds to treat Ms. patients Harper, for conditions 
bringing that was to traditionally lead hospitalisation. So thank you, President Mulford. I welcome the support and I look forward to decision time because I will be supporting the Government's motion. Thank you, Ms Harper. I now call Gillian Mackay to be followed by David Torrance. Around four minutes, please, Ms Mackay. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. As we've heard, hospital at home allows patients to receive acute care in their own home or homely setting. The success of the service has clearly shown that it alleviates pressure on unscheduled acute care in hospitals by reducing, um, reducing admissions. Between April 2022 and March 2023, 11,686 patients were supported by hospital at home services, a 53% increase on the previous year. Healthcare Improvement Scotland has said that the equivalent emergency admissions to inpatient hospitals may have equated to significantly more occupied bed days due to the likelihood of delayed discharges. Furthermore, hospital at home is now growing to be the fifth biggest hospital for older people emergency inpatients, as the number of people benefiting from the service is similar to the latest published numbers of people 65 and over admitted as emergency inpatients to Aberdeen Royal Infirmary or Victoria Hospital in Kirkcaldy. As I said, hospital at home services are clearly reducing pressure on A&Es and the Scottish Ambulance Service, but they can also vastly improve the patient experience, which is what I would like to focus on for the rest of my contribution. Hospital at home has high satisfaction and patient preference across a range of measures. We can see that from the increased demand I referenced earlier. It allows people to be cared for in their own home where they're comfortable and where family and friends can easily visit them, where their things are, their home comforts, pets and things we all take for granted until they aren't there. That impact alone cannot have a price tag put on it and we often lose the humanity for individuals when talking about large-scale programmes. Within hospital at home services, care is coordinated by, in the community by GPs and district nurses, and it therefore ensures continuity of care and the building of positive relationships between patients and healthcare staff. Yep, absolutely. Sanders, go ahead. You're absolutely right about how GPs and primary care need to be there. So the closure of uh, GP practice like Invergary would make this really challenging. Julian McKay. I can absolutely say that it, that it would. It can also positively impact social care delivery. A patient losing their care package due to hospital admission can lead to delayed discharge, with patients being stuck in hospital when they don't need to be. We know that longer stays in hospital can lead to increased frailty in older patients. By preventing hospital admission, however, the hospital at home service enables patients to keep existing agreements for carers visiting their home to help with essential needs. This again maintains continuity of care and allows people to build relationships with their carers, which can be of great comfort to vulnerable patients. I would now like to read one testimony from within my region posted on the Care Opinion website, which demonstrates the positive impact hospital at home can have on patients. I would like to thank the H&H &H team in Cope Bridge for the level of care from the team which exceeded mine and my mum's expectations. The care and attention can only be described as excellent. Not only did this prevent my mum having to go into hospital on two occasions, but the communication, advice and support from the team not only helped my mum, but gave me the confidence that I was treating her to the best of her ability. This testimony clearly shows how hospital at home and the incredible teams working within the service can improve patients' experiences and provide comfort and stability when they are unwell. More broadly, the Health and Social Care Alliance Scotland has said that the hospital at home service reflects a positive change in the culture of how health and social care is delivered by focusing on shared decision making and delivering the personalised outcomes that matter to individuals and their families. It enables more person centred care, which empowers patients to make choices about their care in an environment which is safe and familiar to them. Although hospital at home services alone will not eliminate pressure on acute services, they will form a vital part of a wider system transformation which aims to reduce hospital admissions and ensure more people can be treated at home or in a homely setting. Thank you, Ms Mackay. I now call David Torrance to be followed by Bob Doris. Around four minutes, please, Mr Torrance. Thank you, President Officer. And I welcome this opportunity to speak in this important Scottish Government debate on hospital at home programme in Scotland. This extraordinary initiative has reshaped the landscape of healthcare delivery and quality within our nation, touching and transforming lives within my own constituency of Kirkcaldy and across Scotland. Presiding officer, there is widespread agreement that our health and social care system has faced a number of challenges and obstacles, 
We have all stood in this chamber at a complex of prolonged and rentless change. Brexit, the cost of living crisis, and Scotland's changing demographics, in combination with the challenges of post-pandemic world, has emphasised the urgent need for innovative and patient-centred healthcare solutions. In this content, the Hospital at Home programme thrives, ensuring that our constituents receive the right care in the right place at the right time. And I therefore very much welcome the additional £3.6 million that has been allocated to Hospital at Home to support the more than 150 extra virtual beds. In five, thousands of patients have benefited from Hospital at Home service, and in 2021-22, over 1,000 patients had been supported. The additional funding will help reach more of our constituents and continue to provide comfort and reduce anxiety for people across Scotland. Hospital at Home is safe and dignified alternative to acute hospital admission. It binds passes the anxiety, disruption and disorientation often associated with hospital stays while still delivering the same, if not better, quality of care, whether it be cardiology, geriatrics or a plethora of other specialities, this programme transcends conventional barriers and opens the doors to health care that is truly personalised and patient-centred. Last year, Hospital at Home offered over 63,000 beds, days for adults. That is over 60,000 days when older adults could heal in the comfort of their familiarity, of their homes, surrounded by loved ones. That is over 63,000 days when the dread of an acute hospital admission was replaced by compassionate care that respected their routines, their homes and their dignity. By reducing this pressure on our hospitals, we are creating a vicious cycle of care. Fewer acute admissions mean more time for hospitals to focus on complex cases, less strain on our devoted healthcare professions, and more efficient utilisation of resources. The hospital home programme is not just beneficial for patients, it is a holistic solution that aids the entire healthcare ecosystem. None of these achievements would have been possible without relentless dedication and concerted effort by Healthcare Improvement Scotland. National Education Scotland and clinical networks, whose tireless work has supported the development and implementation of Hospital at Home. I also want to recognise the invaluable service of our dedicated doctors, nurses, therapists and other healthcare professions who make Hospital at Home a reality, who navigate through the complexities of our individual patient needs, often at unsociable hours, and who continue to learn and evolve to serve their patients better. Hospital at Home is not a replacement for hospital admissions, only an alternative, and I have full confidence that the Scots Government and our health ministers are continuing to manage the pressures that remain on the services across the health and social care system. It is vital that we build a health service that best meets the needs of the people it will serve, which is why the Scottish Government is committed to doing it all it can, so those with experience of social care support and community health care have sufficient chance to share reviews. This includes patients who have experienced the hospital at home service and will allow anyone who uses the service has a loved one who relies on care or has worked in the sector to help have their say in the future of the health care landscape. In conclusion, President Officer, Hospital at Home represents a leap in the evolution of the health care delivery in Scotland. It embodies an ethos that recognises the holistic needs of patients, upholds their dignity and optimises the resources of health of the country. As we continue to tackle the many challenges facing Scotland, I welcome the continuation of Hospital at Home so everyone can receive right care at the right time in the right place. Thank you, Mr Torrens. And I now call Bob Doris, who will be the last speaker before I ask uh, the closing uh, speakers to make their contributions. Around four minutes, please, Mr Torres. Thank you very much, President Officer. And I'm pleased to speak in this debate, recognising the contribution of the Scottish Government's Hospital at Home strategy. In Glasgow alone, I'm aware that a test of change pilot for hospital at home was introduced by the Glasgow Integrated Joint Board in January 2022. By March of this year, it was reported that up to 1,200 at-home bed days has already allowed many Glasgow residents over 65 to leave hospital earlier or avoid admission to hospital and instead receive enhanced care at home. This is both better for patients and takes strain off our NHS within an acute setting. Receiving the care we need at home from nurses, advanced nurse practitioners, GPs, pharmacists, occupational therapists, consultant geriatricians, a wraparound service has allowed over 300 Glaswegians to be at home rather than in hospital. That is a success story. But I would be very keen to hear about any qualitative data collected regarding the views of those who have benefited from hospital at home and any changes that they have suggested for adopting. I would also be keen to hear about whether 
as part of hospital at home those patients who require the running of essential medical machines and other equipment, or indeed air mattresses or electric hoists, for example, in their own homes, have been offered support for their utility bills. More generally, of course, those living at home with medical conditions for the longer term have more expense, perhaps due to a more frequent need to wash and dry clothes and bedding, or keep their homes at the right temperature to support the cared for person. So any information the Scottish Government can provide and how it offers assistance would indeed be welcome in the summing up of this debate. However, I do recognise that hospital at home is a success and should be expanded. I also welcome the £10.7 million investment in hospital at home since 2020. Given I understand this initiative is funded by channelling money via integrated joint boards, I would be interested to learn more about how the Scottish Government monitors the wider budget pressures on IGBs given their financial challenges. I have written to the Cabinet Secretary about concerns regarding some changes to provision in my area which may impact on frail elderly. We do not want any unintended consequences. And I look forward to a detailed response in due course on that matter from the Cabinet Secretary. And I want to mention the Hospital to Home Service Presiding Officer offered by Chess Hart and Stroke Scotland. I would note that this week I am sponsoring their exhibit within the Scottish Parliament promoting that very initiative. Hospital to Home is not just for the over 65s, it is for everyone and offers a very significant support. As Chess Hart and Stroke Scotland have stated, Every day in Scotland, people are leaving hospitals scared and alone. But our amazing nurses, support workers and volunteers are here to make sure you don't have to recover alone. They offer free practical help, support and advice. This is offered face-to-face -face and one-to-one -one through community support teams and home visits. Many who have suffered a cardiac arrest or stroke may have been previously active, or they may previously just have lost the confidence to be active itself, or lost their networks that enables them to be connected, active and avoid social isolation. The work of Chest Heart and Stroke Scotland can make a real difference in that context. Hospital to home can lower readmission rates to hospital and avoid unplanned care and scheduled care such as presentations to A&E. So hospital to home clearly has an important part to play and surely complements hospital at home. And I look forward to the further expansion of hospital at home in a way that is informed by patient experience, is iterative and is delivered as part of a broader range of services. I'm supporting the government motion here this afternoon. Thank you, Mr Doris. And we will now move to closing speeches. I would advise members that we do have some time in hand. And on that note, I call on Paul Sweeney to close on behalf of Scottish Labour uh, around six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer, and it is a pleasure to close this debate on behalf of the Labour Party. And I think there is broad consensus across the Chamber this afternoon on the benefits in principle of hospital at home. Um, I know certainly from personal experience, I'm sure many others do, that being in hospital is a rubbish experience. It's frustrating and deeply tedious, um, certainly for a younger person, but for an older person it can also be potentially life-threatening. We've heard of the potential impacts on frailty, on acquiring uh, an infection, and that can potentially lead to uh, a, a fatal spiral. So any measure which can move the emphasis of care away from acute settings and into um, home settings is to be commended, and that is why we are all in broad support of the scheme. But I think um, the member for Glasgow, Mary Ellen Springborn, made an important point about that in itself. How do we ensure the resilience of the home setting? So there's one emphasis on hospital, but how do we emphasize the resilience of the home setting? And I think there is much more work to be done in that space. Um, Mr. Doris mentioned, for example, how do we ensure adaptions are made to homes to ensure that there is a sufficient facility available for people? I think we need to do much more uh, in respect of housing associations and, and uh, registered social landlords to ensure that they are able to be supported. Yes, happy to give way. Edward Mountain. Uh, I thank Mr. Sweeney very much for giving way on that point. Not only is it about adaptions to the home, but it's making sure the correct equipment follows the patient to home. And that's been a problem across the Highlands. Has that been a problem in his area? And does he think more work should be undertaken on that? Paul Sweeney. I absolutely recognise that. I think it is a major issue uh, and one that's not well understood. And I think the call for extra data and understanding of that qualitative experience is essential 
for us to ensure that this works as best as it can. There is not only the issue about facilities, about the costs of running equipment that can be quite energy intensive, particularly in a cost of living crisis, um, but also the complex needs of individuals in the home setting. There was a very striking exhibition that has been held by a series of um, hospice care providers in Glasgow called The Cost of Dying uh, at the University of Glasgow. And it was quite harrowing to see some of the experiences of people who wanted to die at home, wanted to have a, a good death, um, but were prevented from doing so because of the failure of the registered social landlords to make necessary adaptions to their homes. So they ended up languishing in hospital in their final days, uh, not acceptable. Um, and I think we need to do so much more to ensure the rights of the patient are upheld. And I think that was something that the member for Rutherglen mentioned about the patient focus being essential. Also, not necessarily if someone can't stay in their home, there are maybe second step down services. It was mentioned by the member for um, Galloway and West Dumfries about cottage hospitals, that kind of setting being potentially an opportunity, potentially having more uh, sheltered accommodation where there is a sort of semi supervised activity. Um, certainly, some housing associations are exemplars in providing those facilities. Let's look at how we can build on that capability across Scotland. I think that is something we need to look at to ensure that this hospital home concept is better embedded. And I think that was something that was recognised by members across the chamber today as well, that it might not be as well known as maybe the ministers think it is, because certainly some members did allude to the fact that they weren't aware of it prior to today, um, or had only recently become aware of it. Uh, whilst it is a relatively recent innovation, um, it's to be welcomed. I think we do need to do more to disseminate the information about how this can function well. Um, and I think that's often fed back to me, certainly, uh, particularly when it comes to palliative care as well, that often people don't know their rights and they're so stressed by the situation that they don't realise what they could have achieved um, for their relative or, or uh, the person in their responsibility for care until it was too late and they'd already passed away. So I think we do need to look at that. But also we need to look at how we build resilience. It was mentioned by... Um, Mr Doris, about the budget, 10.7 million since 2020. But that's, in, that's set against the fact that even in Glasgow, as, as the member will be aware, um, the Integrated Joint Board is facing £20 million pounds of cuts this financial year alone and has had to dip into its savings or its reserves to the tune of £17 million. Pounds. That's a really shaky peg to be hanging the system on and we really need to look at the underlying fragility of the Integrated Joint Boards um, and, and ability to step this up when we're facing 200 jobs being lost from the IGB service providers in Glasgow alone. Um, that is a major risk to the resilience of the hospital home system. So whilst we recognise the huge opportunity, we have one of the most acute hospital-centric healthcare systems in the OECD. We need to move the emphasis out of the hospitals and into the community. Uh, we really need to look at putting serious resource into that. And I would argue that the Cabinet Secretary has to recognise the need to ramp this up and be serious about it. And that was what my colleague, uh, Ms Mocken, a uh, member for South Scotland, mentioned about the long-term plan. We really need that long-term vision for how this develops. We need stable budgeting. Uh, we need the ability for the IGBs to properly plan for the long term and to build those pathways for career development, for training, uh, and actually to increase staff wages as well, because we're really having a problem with retention and morale. We've heard about the issues of hospices not being able to fully staff their beds. Um, this is just a tip of the iceberg situation. So, yep, huge issues there, um, huge issues in the practicalities between urban settings being one thing, but rural settings, and there's a number of members across the chamber today who have mentioned the practical challenges of managing hospital at home when you're faced with such wide geographical constraints. Um, that needs to be looked at as well, and I think that is something that is essential to be fed back. What does this look like in a city? What does it look like in a rural setting? It's not a one-size-fits-all thing, and I think it would be good if the minister highlighted some of the challenges faced in those different geographical environments. Um, I think also there is a major issue about the opportunity um, of freeing up capacity. I think uh, Ms Mackay, Member for Central Scotland, mentioned that it's a huge opportunity to free up bed space, to reduce costs in the healthcare system. Um, but how do we really ensure that it's not simply displacing capacity in terms of staff from other parts of the healthcare system and thus accentuating the problems we're having across the, the entire healthcare ecosystem, as a member for Cody mentioned. So whilst we're all for it, we're all very supportive of it, we have to be cognizant of the major practical constraints that we are facing. It's essential that Scotland achieves the best possible healthcare system for us all, um, but we must be aware of the acute problems we're facing today and work through them in a collegiate and cooperative way. And with that, I'm happy to support the government's motion this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Sweeney. And I now call on Edward Mountain to close on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives. Around seven minutes, please, Mr Mountain.
Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I welcome today's debate um, at a time when our health service is in crisis like never before. Patients do need smart and resourceful solutions which do not compromise their care. That's exactly why the Scottish Conservatives support this uh, hospital at home programme, providing, of course, that care at home is will free up capacity in our hospitals. It's initiatives like this that are vital for reducing hospital admissions for elderly patients, especially for those who prefer treatment in the comfort of their own homes too. And I'll give credit where credit's due, because I think it is important. Those that benefit from this programme are far more likely to avoid hospital care and care home stays for a period of up to six months after acute illness. And that's good news. That saves our precious hospital beds and creates space for all the other patients to receive the treatment they need, the patients that often sit on long waiting lists. That's why, though, it's disappointing that this government has failed to deliver the promise to double the capacity of the hospital at home programme by the end of last year. My question, how many patients would have benefited but haven't because of that failure? because that is a real question we need to address, because this programme can make a difference. It is only a partial solution, though, to the hospital backlog that has grown under the SNP. Indeed, hospital at home is not appropriate for every patient, much like the rollout of NHS near me. It can act as a complement rather than a replacement to acute patient care. The stark truth is, however, it's not going to solve the problems of delayed discharges. We know that there's 1,700 beds still being blocked every day and the effects on those patients are so destroying. It's leading to increased weights at A&E as well as lengthy of delays in vital procedures. And my colleague, Dr. Gulhani, has mentioned in his speech the SNP promised to eradicate delayed discharges in 2015 but every health secretary since has failed miserably to do so. And let's be honest, patients are paying the price. The former health secretaries who broke their promises include the first and deputy first ministers. It's not good enough. So turning to the speakers in this debate, I'd just like to make a few points on what I heard. I appreciate the cabinet secretary's point, and I wonder if you should reflect on the fact that he should be asking, and the health services should be asking, not should we do this, but can we do this? Let's make it possible. Let's urge doctors to ask that question. Can we do it? Remember that there are risks to sending people home, but the risks may not be as high as keeping them in hospital. I remember when my father was waiting to go home, he was told, I was told clearly that there was a risk in sending him home. He was dying. We knew what the risks were. Let's make it possible where we can. Dr. Galhani has also mentioned um, the importance, as we've heard, about delayed discharges. And we've got to work harder at sorting that out. And we've got to make sure that when people go into hospital, we have a way of ensuring that there are people there who can ensure that their discharges happen uh, and go out at the right time. And that might require people to give them power of attorney over decision-making processes in the medical front. It's taken by Paul Sweeney's comments uh, about supporting the principal uh, and uh, making sure that it's important for social care to be there to step up when the need comes for that person to go home. But I think it's also important to remember the very point he made about that it won't be suitable for everyone. And not everyone can afford the costs of going home and the extra costs that will be required for them to have a sensible uh, care package at home, which may require extra heating and elect extra elect electrical use. Alex Cole Hamilton recognised the staff shortages, um, and I think we all recognise that. And I think we understand that to make this work, we've got to recruit additional staff on top of the staff that we see already in the system. Um, and I agree with Claire Hawkey's point, is high quality person-centred care has got to be at the centre of all of this. It's really important. And I think she also made the point that we need to increase the funds. And what about the extra kit that's needed that I, I raised uh, with Ms Sweeney? It's really important that we make sure that we have the kit to follow people when they're home. 
Yes, of course I'll take a point. Clear okay. intervention. I thank Edward Mountain for taking the intervention, and I think, yes, the, 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 at, the, at the heart of this is about being patient-centred and allowing patients to be where they need to be, whether that be to be at home to recover, or whether that be they be at home to die, surrounded by their loved ones. I did mention funding, but what I referenced was the funding that the Scottish Government has already committed to this. Edward Mountain. Thank you, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I'll accept that... Uh, that, that uh, qualification on the point, but the point I'm trying to make is that extra funding will always be required because caring for people at home brings additional costs, getting extra staff there, getting extra equipment there and all of those, and we need to be responsive to it because there is a cost involved. Now, Oliver Mundell made the point, and I think really important point that I think uh, uh, Finde Carson also made about the importance of cottage hospitals and how much they will pay in, in, in stepping down from hospital and allowing patients to go home. Now, I thought Christine Graham was going to... She started off her uh, talk about... Uh, talking about extra equipment that was needed, and that, that then dropped away. And I, I may have misheard, uh, but I do think that she made the point about having the important, importance of having teams who could help people at home and, and I would say that just if, I, if I've got time, presiding officer, but I, I would just make the point, we do need teams that are probably a little bit more advanced than we have in the local community, which is why in the Highlands we've got the pre-hospital immediately care team that can deploy if they're needed to, to do care at home where uh, perhaps local doctors are not able to. Sorry, I'll give to Ms. I thank you, Edward Mountain. Just to clarify, I don't think I mentioned extra equipment, but I did say a full assessment has to be made if it's the right place, the right time for the right person. And by implication, that also might involve equipment. Edward Mountain. OK, uh, another qualification, but great. You, you, we, we've got there that the extra equipment might be needed after a full assessment. So I, I very much take that point. And... Uh, I think Emma Harper's point was actually an interesting thing, and I think that, you know, with her experience in nursing, we should be aware that I think a lot of what she was saying about being at home is a tonic to speed recovery and aids people to get through their illnesses better. And I think there's general agreement from all other speakers on this. And so, in conclusion, presiding officer, I would say that I welcome the small but significant progress that has been made in the hospital at home programme. However, I think uh, patients still need to see some big ideas and big investment from the government. We need to see sufficient kit uh, for, to allow patients to go home, and we need to see sufficient care support to allow those people who have gone home to go, to go home in the comfort and knowledge they, they will get the best possible care. But the problem is we haven't seen the real tackling of the problem, which in my mind is the whole issue of delayed discharges, long A&E waiting times and the social care crisis. Until we see some fresh thinking on these, I believe our hospitals will continue to run out of beds despite this programme because I think the government has run out of steam on how to resolve that and I would ask them to do that as a matter of extreme urgency. Thank you, President Officer. Thank you, Mr Mountain. I now call on Minister Marie Todd to close on behalf of the Scottish Government uh, around nine minutes or perhaps more. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I really welcome the opportunity to close this debate, which has provided members with an update on the benefits of Hospital at Home and the action that we are taking to support the development and expansion of Hospital at Home programmes. I would like to take this opportunity to recognise the hard work and commitment of our partners who have worked to establish and expand this crucial service. These services are by their nature both personal and person-centred. They are delivered by highly skilled and valued health and care staff and are intently focused on delivering for the needs of the individual in their own environment. I want to thank Health Improvement Scotland for the support they've been giving to local areas since 2020 to grow an active learning network of health and social care partnerships. This support has enabled the expansion of Hospital at Home from 7 to 21 health and social care partnerships. But I would like us to go further and have even wider geographical spread. I also want to thank NHS Education Scotland for their work in developing training materials for the Hospital at Home programme and to our health boards and health and social care partnerships for their ongoing support and commitment to delivering more acute care in the home. 
I want to thank everyone across the Chamber for their input and reflections through today's debate. There's clear consensus here today that providing person-centred care, which takes full account of an individual's wishes and balances that with safety and clinical need, is a priority. Turning to Mr. the... Certainly. Finlay Carson. I really appreciate the Minister giving way. You, you touch uh, upon... Uh, the, the views of the, the patient. But in areas like Dumfries and Galloway, uh, hospital at home is not always going to be the ideal situation. And some patients would prefer to be in the surroundings similar to a cottage hospital or, or where services that a cottage hospital would traditionally deliver right at home rather than potentially having to travel 50 or 60 miles to the acute hospital or, as, as Emma Harper said, 50 or 60 miles to uh, 18 beds that are being delivered in Dumfries. Can you tell us what role you think step-down facilities like cottage hospitals should play as part of the package in rural areas? I remind members we need to speak through the chair. Minister. Presiding officer, as the Cabinet Secretary said in response to Finlay Carson's intervention on him, these decisions are really best made by the local health board, who absolutely are well aware of the needs of the local community. Let me, let me just put to bed the issue around rural areas. A number of people have raised the challenges of delivering hospital at home in a rural area. And I, as a rural representative, a member for, for Caithness, Sutherland and Ross, I'm well aware of the challenges. But I would say it could be argued that it's even more important to deliver this in rural areas because admission is much more disruptive to patients and their families. And I would have to say NHS Highland are delivering hospital at home. They're delivering it in Sky. It's being delivered in the Western Isles by the NHS Western Isles. If it can work in Sky and the Western Isles, it can work anywhere. Turning to the specific questions which have been raised during the debate, um, to respond to Carol Mohan's point, we've been using hospital at home for over a decade. It started in December 2011 and we've expanded it recently. It is absolutely here to stay. The reason it's here to stay is because people are absolutely at the heart of hospital at home programme. They value the flexibility and the security that being in a home setting brings. And particularly for elderly people, those familiar faces and spaces reduces the potential for adverse inc incidents. Ultimately, it's about creating the options that best suit people and communities and ensuring access to the right care in the right place. That's a direct quote from Alliance Director Eileen Oldfather. The Alliance also spoke to hospital at home patients, Stephen Green, who said, if you fancy a cup of tea or if you fancy a sandwich, it's there, you know. If you fancy a chat with your wife or on the phone or whatever, it's there. For something like what was ailing me, hospital at home is ideal. This has done me a lot of good, I know, and I would recommend it to anyone it suits. In terms of the number of people benefiting from hospital at home, we talked a little bit about the numbers. The latest published data on the uh, number of people 65 and over admitted as emergency inpatient state, Aberdeen Royal Infirmary, that's 12,262 people, or Victoria Hospital Kirkcaldy, that's 10,999, is pretty similar to the number of people who are benefiting from hospital at home. That makes hospital at home the fifth biggest hospital for older people emergency inpatients. A number of people raised the issue of impact on unpaid carers and it is absolutely essential that we ensure that our valued unpaid carers are supported and aren't overwhelmed, particularly when their loved one is in crisis. Now, the feedback from Alliance Scotland indicates that hospital at home transfers control back to the patient and carer and they value that. It's providing care on their terms, in their environment. And that obviously, as many have said, indicates that patients recover quicker and feel involved in decisions along the way. Um, some people mentioned the impact on GPs and on primary care, and there has been a concern that it puts, places a burden and on, a, on an already 
overburdened area of um, our health and care system. Now, Professor Ellis, our DCMO, um, was asked about this and he said, I know this was a concern when I met with GPs prior to starting in Lanarkshire, but there's no evidence that hospital at home creates additional work to routine hospital admission. And in reality, it's about partnership between primary and secondary care in the patient's interests. It should be recognised one moment, it should be recognised that routine hospital admissions can create potential work for GPs and that arguably the debate is about what patients need, not about whose workload is affected. Certainly happy to give way. Oliver Mundell. I, I thank the Minister for giving way. Does she accept that there are now parts of Scotland where primary care has broken down completely and people are unable to routinely see a GP? How can a programme like this work without that key linchpin? Minister. So uh, what I would agree with is that that uh, GPs are absolutely a linchpin. They're the front door of our NHS and they are key, which is why we are investing in general practice and which is why we value it so much. Um, addressing the issues of delayed discharge, um, we have a hospital occupancy action plan Addressing delayed discharge is of absolute critical importance. And although over 97% of all discharge are with, uh, discharges are without delay, we've already made available earlier this year up to £8 million of funding to support HSCPs, purchase around 500 interim care beds to increase interim capacity. These are in addition to around 500 interim beds that are already helping patients in the system. There's a delayed discharge in hospital occupancy plan, building on best practice to address the issues that were experienced last year. Let me tell you, we are well into planning for next winter already, and it is being implemented at pace, delivering the actions that we know work. There's a whole system oversight and planning group in place to assess progress in implementation of the action plan and to plan for future peaks. Um, so there is a lot of work going on right across the board in in, an, in a system which we all acknowledge is under pressure. Um, let me just pick up on the point that Christine Graham raised around Midlothian. I had the absolute delight of visiting the Midlothian Community Hospital in recent weeks and I met their teams, multidisciplinary teams, but mainly allied health professionals, physiotherapists, occupational therapists, who I was absolutely inspired by. They were working in an incredibly flexible way, a patient centred way, a holistic way to ensure that people got the right care in the right place at the right time. And of course they were keen to emphasise to me how much better it was to be able to assess people's abilities in their own homes and their wider needs were much more visible than they would have been if the assessments took place in the hospital. Hospital at home is a tried and tested concept deployed across the globe and in many ways Scotland's at the forefront of this growing movement. Internationally, evidence has been accumulating across a range of clinical specialties, including older people, respiratory, cardiology, paediatrics, infectious diseases, as to the benefits of this approach. It offers comparable care to that provided in an inpatient bed, but with reduced risk of the harms um, that the Cabinet Secretary for NHS Recovery, Health and Social Care set out in his opening remarks. But beyond the benefits to the patient of providing care at home and reducing pressures on the NHS, we also know that it can reduce the need for older people to be admitted to a care home. Evidence from a large study conducted across the UK found that hospital at home for older people reduced nursing home admission by as much as 42%. Being able to stay safely in your own home when you're unwell or receiving treatment matters hugely to many people. But we also know that a hospital at home is able to deliver the best hospital care to people people who are in nursing homes, minimising the disruption for some of the most frail in our society. So as noted by the CADSET, we've pledged a total of £11.2 million to develop and expand hospital at home since 2020, given our firm commitment to offering the service to more people across Scotland. We'll regularly review our funding for the programme to assess whether it matches our ambition. We're committed to the continuing expansion of hospital at home across a range of specialty areas, and I'd be very happy to return to Parliament with an update on this in due course. 
In conclusion, I do not support the opposition amendments to this motion for the reasons set out during this debate, but instead I commend the motion lodged by the Cabinet Secretary for NHS recovery, health and social care. I look forward to working with our partners to continue the expansion of the Hospital at Home programme and to ensure that the public is aware of its benefits and that we remain committed to patient safety and the highest quality of care. By taking an approach that puts the person and their needs and their wishes firmly at the centre, we'll provide the type of careful and kind care that we would wish to exemplify in all of our services and help more people to receive acute care in a familiar setting within their own communities. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the debate on Hospital at Home programme in Scotland. It's now time to move on to the next item of business. There are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first is that Amendment 9191.2 in the name of Sandesh Gulhani, which seeks to amend Motion 9191 in the name of Michael Matheson on Hospital at Home programme in Scotland, be agreed. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed, therefore we will move to a vote and there will be a short suspension to allow members to access the digital voting system.